is that we get to hear from employers about various different aspects, largely related to cloud, because we have a what we call a tiger team from our built team that is working on hybrid cloud capstone projects, and that will be this afternoon. So they're here today. I'd like to introduce them one at a time in no particular order. Um, Curtis Burchett, he is from NetApp. He's a technical, you're more than a technical specialist. You're a guru. <laughs> Welcome, Curtis. Oh, <laughs> Bonnie Suntar. Bonnie, some of you know who she is, right? He's the instructor for <laughs> Lucas Fig is the divisional VMware technical lead at Dell EMC, or at least that's what your LinkedIn says. <laughs> Oliver Ryder is a sales engineer for Palo Alto. And then Glenn Winter, the illustrious. <laughs> Glenn, give a hand. Glenn happens to be the uh, chairman emeritus for our bill team. He was chair for many, many years. And he's an author and co founder of RDM Innovation Training. He's a futurist in residence for Interlink, and if you don't know about Interlink, you need to know. And he's retired, sort of, a retired innovation engineer or leader for Dell. So we have an illustrious panel today, and I'm looking forward to asking all the questions. But I'm taking my mic, and I'm going down, and I'm going to ask them, and you get to ask them questions as well. Okay. Well, <clears throat> We can start with the first one. We don't need to waste any time. We talk about the need for lifelong learning. How do you think we instill that into students? I guess I would, just to start out, I would just say that um, nowadays, technology and everything is changing so fast that you have to have the attitude of lifelong learning, right? can't just rely on setting back and whatever you learn in college or, or whatever, you're, you're done, you know. You have to constantly be, um, you have to constantly be improving yourself. And so with that being said, I would just say that, um, you know, it, it, it means a lot for you to do this. I mean, because, because you are really, it's really a competitive advantage for learning is, right? You have to think of it like that. Um, and so as an individual or as a company or as an industry, you know, you really have to think about learning as a competitive advantage. So you have to constantly be learning. And so I guess, um, it, you know, the, one of the fundamental things I think people need to learn at college or sometime in their life is what I would say is computational thinking, right? And so computational thinking, I would just de define it as, you know, you, you deconstruct a problem, you know, and then you identify patterns within that problem <coughs> statement, and then you generalize those patterns and then you come up with some type of solution from it. And so, so that type of thought process, I think, is very important. That's why I always encourage my sons and anybody to take math, right? To just, because math is not just about finding a particular answer. It's about, it's about trying to figure out how to reason and how to think. And so, um, so it, I, I would just say that that computational thinking is a skill that everybody needs to have, and we need to really make sure that everybody is able to, as I said, deconstruct a problem, gener uh, find patterns in that problem, you know, be able to generalize those patterns to find some type of solution. 
you know, so. <coughs> Any other comment on that? Yeah, you probably don't need a microphone for me. I talk really loud. But uh, when, I, when I talk to students, anywhere down even to first and second grade, uh, one of the things I tell them as a futurist is we've looked out and the expectation is most people will have five careers. That's not five jobs. That's five careers. And if you go into IT, the good news is you might have one career for your whole life, but you're going to probably have to study twice as hard as the people who have five careers. Uh, you can't be a print set at a newspaper and do that for the rest of your life. In fact, no one does that job anymore. It's obsolete now. There's many jobs, as many as 50% of the jobs are going to go obsolete uh, over the next 25, 30 years. So if you look at the kids in elementary school, they're 40 and 50 and 70 years from now. They may still be working. Uh, so they're going to have to be curious. And that's what I tell people that are going to come into IT is you have to want to learn because you're going to have to learn every year, if not every three months or six months. If you look at things like hybrid cloud, it may have been around being talked about. I did a little research on it this week. 2013, people were putting out case studies on hybrid cloud. How many people here in here taught hybrid cloud in 2013? I didn't think I'd have to count too high. So cloud maybe. So when you start looking at that, things that have been around a long time that hit mainstream, uh, that 2013 to now took five years for 40 to 50 percent of companies either to be implementing hybrid cloud or talking about implementing hybrid cloud. Uh, technologies are coming out in 2019 and getting implemented in 2019 and becoming mainstream in 2020. So these are all learning opportunities. Uh, when you look at a technician, a network technician, for example, they used to have to be really good at uh, setting up <coughs> the scripts on a router or a switch, learning about voice over IP. No one mentioned to them that it might be really helpful if you knew Python. Mm -hmm. You should probably take a coding class in there somewhere too. So the jobs aren't only changing, they're growing broader and broader. Uh, we talk about all the time with our students in Build that you, no longer can you just be good at networking. You better understand what's upstream and downstream from it. You better understand the solution. At some point, you're going to have to understand the business behind it. So you're going to probably take business courses. So it's, it's a learning environment. And the good news, bad news is IT guys are always going to have a job. That's the good news. The bad news is they're always going to have to learn. Let me ask another question, and we can come back to any of these as time goes on. Uh, what would not go in a hybrid? Well, first of all, how about define hybrid cloud for those who might not know? Somebody? I'll take it. Um, I think it, this largely depends on uh, maybe who initially brought the concept to you, whether it was a vendor, um, which many of us are, or whether it was through traditional instruction. Um, generally speaking, hybrid cloud is the pairing of public and private is the most common view. However, um, you know there's there's a shift in the industry right now around the term cloud in general. Cloud is an operating model; it is not a place, right? And hybrid is the interconnectivity between two clouds. Um, and with the introduction of multi-cloud, where say you have Azure, AWS, Google, they, they're all fundamentally the same in the outcome, but the way that they achieve those things are very different. So operating across those three clouds does take some difference in approach, and it, there's different disciplines that are built um, to avoid the silos that, that, are, that have been built in traditional IT. They're, everyone's taking this multi-cloud, uh, multi-discipline approach where you are, are mastering or at least learning one by one each type of cloud. And, and trying to bring the same fundamental practices to each of those clouds. So when we talk about hybrid cloud, you know, I generally rebase that into two clouds of the same fundamental technology type with the ability to, to move workloads or data across them. So um, there's, there's some prime examples of what that looks like in a public-private relationship today. Um, that would be Azure to Azure Stack. Um, it would be any VMware public cloud to any VMware on-prem. Uh, AWS has outposts pending, um, which will be a, a third type. I think they just died. I don't know, made up. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of, you know, when I say hybrid, at least me personally, and I think more and more the industry is addressing it this way, hybrid is the pairing of two fundamentally same architectures so that you have portability. And then multi-cloud is when you span 
disparate disciplines or technologies and, and bring them under a common operating model and a common team. So what kinds of things would you put in the hybrid cloud? Everything? I talk too much, so I'm gonna have to count how many times and let to make sure it's stop. <laughs> is, I, I, I looked at that question and I rephrased it as I did a little bit of research and said, instead of what can't go in a cloud, what are the constraints that stop it from going in the cloud? And there's one very important law of physics, and it has to do with latency. Is latency is probably the biggest killer. If you have an application that has a latency constraints, then you really can't be running across clouds that are located thousands of miles apart or even more than that or even geographically across the globe. So latency is one of the biggest problems. Then the next one is how hard do you want to work to put it in a hybrid cloud? And the more work you're willing to do and the more integration you're willing to do, you can solve a number of other problems. A couple of them is like uh, probably the, the most important one for many of the people in the room would be around HIPAA regulations and around PCI or credit card regulations. And in both of those cases, you have to be able to show that you have control of the data. So if you put, there are certain clouds when you go out there, in fact, I'm not sure if it's still this way, but when you go into AWS, they didn't really tell you exactly what data center and in what city your information was stored and how many different places it was. If you have that PCI data or HIPAA, or even if you're a country such as Germany, where you don't want certain pieces of data leaving the country, then you have to have SLAs written and processes in place around who can open a file, who can access a file, what has to be documented if it's done, things like that. So could you put HIPAA data in a hybrid cloud environment? I'm sure people are doing it today. But there's a lot more work to do those type of things. So that'd be one of the things that I'd say is look at what the level of difficulty and then decide is, is this the first project I want to take on or do I want to do an easier one first? Yeah, and I'll kind of add to that, that, that latency conversation is generally paired with uh, what we would call the data gravity uh, conversation, which is if you are looking at a public-private pairing or even a private-private, if you have many interdependent applications, which most large enterprises do, rarely do applications stand alone. They share common data sets, they share messaging buses, there's common architectures. If the, the gravity of the data that these applications consume, that, that gravity well exists in your private cloud, and you're discussing moving a, a, an interdependent or even a part of that application to the public cloud, what is the latency and what is the response time and what is the impact to the user experience? And what did the business benefit by doing so, right? Sometimes it's actually worth it to fully replicate that data into a public, public cloud, which then is somewhat hybrid, I but I would argue it's really a, a standalone replicated data set. One may be the record of truth. So, you know, the, the early conversations around what goes to the cloud, what doesn't, there's two fundamental systems that enterprise, uh, enterprises uses. There's systems of record, SAP, Oracle, all the kind of big names that you know, and then there's systems of engagement. And the systems of engagement is really where things have been consumerized. So if you open an app on your phone and you interact with your business or with your bank, that, that's a system of engagement. It may use their systems of record all the way back to mainframe, which has been <coughs> declared dead 50, you know, 50 times over the past 40 years, but it's still there, right? It, it runs, mainframe still runs every core system that is critical to our infrastructure. Banking, insurance, uh, travel, like it, it, it is so inherent to the system that you can't just dump it, right? So when, when people start to get really dogmatic around the uh, idea of everything's gonna be in the cloud, I, I generally, generally just point at the mainframe and say, what happened to those guys, right? So will more and more happen in the, in the cloud? Absolutely, but again, you know, the, 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 the position of more and more in the industry is it's, cloud is not a place, it's a way of doing business, and that requires new partnerships and new thinking aligned to the business, and if you're doing things in hybrid, for the sake of hybrid, it'll fail because the business doesn't understand or care. If you're aligned with the business, then they, and they're seeing value out of it, then they're willing to invest the time and the effort and the change of process and engagement model that it requires. If we prepare students using a curriculum that is more cloud oriented 
and focuses on hybrid cloud, if not just cloud in general, what sorts of positions will they be qualified to enter once they actually go into the workforce? Let's say they finish a two-year degree and their degree is in IT with a focus on cloud. What kinds of things would they get to do? Much? So, uh, I'll take that. Because I have a recent graduate from my home. Um, so, the same kind of jobs that people were doing um, when the cloud wasn't there, such as software development, uh, automation, um, any sort of uh, um, allied um, work that goes around software development, they still exist. It's just going to be in the cloud. And so we need not only those software development skills, but also the skills that, um, that are uh, aligned to working in the cloud environment. So every job that existed before will exist. It's just going to be in a different area. And so Address, please, an entry-level student, entry-level graduate. What are you going to let them do? Say that again? What, what, what kinds of jobs will you let them do? <laughs> because I, I know that you, you are clamoring for more and more qualified candidates for jobs, but I have a suspicion that many of those jobs that you're having trouble filling are kind of up the food chain just a little bit from where an entry-level person would be. Is that correct or not correct? I mean, entry level has its place, right? Every company is looking for fresh graduates because they're coming in with new ideas, new things that they're learning uh, in the campuses, which means the uh, college has to teach them all the latest technologies because that's what the companies are looking for them to bring into their work environment because the people that have been working there for 20 years, 30 years have outdated ideas. So they got to bring in all those new um, thought process. And so every job has a place for new entrants into the job. And so any job, um, in two years, they're going to become experienced in that job, right? So any job that is open to experienced person, they will have a spot for a new entrant as well. Any other comments on that one? Yeah, I mean, I would say that by and large, they're, they're going to be junior admin positions, right? Like, and they're not going to be in multidiscipline roles doing architecture. Uh, I would say one of the unique areas right now is uh, maybe in the security space. Um, they're traditionally security was the career path of the network admin, right? So you started as a switch person, got to routers, got to firewalls, boom, now I'm security guy because perimeter defense ruled the roost, right? Like, that's really, as long as I guard the walls, I'm good. That no longer works. It is ineffective because your own internal employees will do silly things like pick up USB drives from the, from the parking lot and plug them in. So now that there's this dearth of, of security areas that need to be addressed, the, the traditional network admin to security track still exists. Um, it's still very relevant. But they're more focused on enacting the policies that a true cybersecurity professional is, is laying down, right? So someone is responsible for reading NIST, for understanding the F FFIEC, you know, OCC, whatever regulatory body that is out there. Someone has to take that and turn it into actionable policies that can be implemented by those, the, the more hands-on keyboard security professionals. So the, the people that are interpreting that data and enacting policy are two different people. They should be per you know CISSP, you know division of duties. Um, so the, there there is a large opportunity as this security becomes more and more important and more and more regulated for people to enter directly into that track. Me personally, oh it's painful. But um, there are people who would enjoy that sort of thing, and and so I would say that that probably was where someone could get probably the biggest entry opportunity. Um, if you're more a multi-discipline, hands-on keyboard, servers, storage, network, expect junior admin positions that are very focused on one particular aspect of that multi-discipline and it's incumbent upon that student to develop and show that they have skills beyond that particular silo. Um, so that, that would be you know my, my guidance. Okay. Oh, can you hold just a second? I want to 
want to shift a little bit into cybersecurity first and then we'll come back. Um, we need to trust that our digital lines are, by the way, they submitted these questions. <laughs> so they're prepared to answer them. Trust, we need to trust that our digital lines are safe and secure, obviously. And with the continued digital transformation of our world, that can be a big problem. What? Oh. Oops. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, we need to trust that our digital lives are secure and with all of the various digital transformations going on, uh, that could be a really big problem. What do you think we can do within our programs, our largely two-year programs, although some are four-year, uh, what can we do to fill the at least 1.5 million unfilled cybersecurity positions? Yeah, so, uh, yeah, going back to your, you know, and this touches on the previous topic as well, you know, what, what are some career tracks and, and what are some positions that, you know, a recent graduate could fill in a cloud-centric um, organization? Uh, I, I think definitely security is, is a, a great career track because, uh, you know, like you touched on, you know, traditionally on a, on a you know, a network administrator in, a, in an organization, um, you know, they would have a lot of visibility into what was happening on their network. And that's totally different in a cloud environment. You've got applications and you've got infrastructure, you know, in, in different, uh, you know, cloud service providers in different places and you don't have a, a single sort of network infrastructure visibility into that. And um, so that's really, security is kind of filling that role now where they, they have visibility into what's happening into those different, in those different cloud environments. Um, and they're the ones that, you know, um, can help make sure that, that, that it's available and it's secure. Um, so there's, yeah, there's a lot of opportunity there uh, as far as career path goes. Uh, you know, security operations, they would call it, you know, uh, monitoring activity in the cloud environment, monitoring events, you know, monitoring things that are happening on endpoints, on servers, uh, in applications, you know, collecting and correlating all that information, and then trying to figure out, you know, uh, if that's something malicious or, you know, bad that's going on. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I wanted to add to that is when, when we talk about a 1. 1. 1.5 million expected to be unfilled job positions around security, that's not the filled ones. If you go out and look at Glassdoor as Ann has recently, you're going to find many areas where the number of job openings that are unfilled after six months of looking are in the tens or hundreds of thousands. Now, this isn't a problem that's going to go away. It's not going to be just security. The way we would have done college back 15 years ago isn't going to work. We have to do things. There's a phrase you should you should uh, think globally and drink locally. Uh, it's a great one if you're a beer drinker. Uh, I tried it out; it was great. Uh, but what that really means is we have people from all over the United States in here. When you look at security, and you look, in fact, Ernie and I talked about this before coming up here, is you have to look at your community. Where are people going to get jobs now? People getting schooled in Frisco or Plano, Texas, they could be working with 100 miles of here in security and they probably have a dozen jobs to choose from. So it's not going to be a lack of jobs, it's going to be a lack of having focused training. And to get that focused training isn't somebody sitting in their, their office at the college saying, I think we should add this to the training. It's what the built team does, the business and industry leadership team. And your local teams go out and get people on those teams that are hiring people that are going to come out of the community college and get them to tell you, I need the following skills, knowledge, skills, and abilities, KSA, we all know what they are. Don't ask them for what college courses do they need to have, because I'll, trust me, if you aren't a college professor, you don't know what goes into that college course. All you care is that they've got those knowledge, skills, and abilities. You've got to, you'll get a big picture from a global or from a national organization, but take it down to your community. Where are those people going to work? If you're near Kansas City or if you're on the coast, is there going to be a tie into something in marine? Are you in a manufacturing area? Look at those areas and find out what do they need. And it could be they don't need associate students. There are jobs right now. There's a company, Merit America, a nonprofit. They're founded out in Washington, D.C. They're also in the Dallas area now. They actually went out to companies like J.P. Morgan Chase and said, we hear you have a big need for programmers. What do you need? And they said, 
We have 130 unfilled openings for Java programmers right now. If you train people in Java programming, we will hire every one you train. Well, they're now putting 45 people through a condensed program to specifically train them on Java. Not on Python, not on C++, Java. And they're going to get a job at J.P. Morgan Chase. By the way, that's the most dominant language in the enterprise space. 100,000 plus down. openings right now for Java. Now, if you take that down to our skills, if somebody, and I'm going to use an example I think we can now, a company called Raytheon. Pretty much everybody knows who they are. They had a time a few years ago where they said, we advertise 16 openings we have for a contract. They, the person needed to pass a security test. That's, that's a big hurdle for a lot of young people. Uh, <laughs> but a, a drug test to go with that, by the way. And they have to fall in a mirror if we hold it up in front of their face. And they have to have security plus. They could not find, they hired one person in months. 15 openings, nobody applied to do those things. So we actually set up here a program where we teach them at both Dell. Dell had people, they needed Security Plus for their SOC, Raytheon. So we were actually having instructors go out and teach off-premise specifically to meet those companies' needs. Dell and Raytheon said, we're going to hire these people. We can't find them. Make sure they fall them here before you bring them in, though, and teach them Security Plus. But after that, you know, they're, they're golden. They're going to get a job. And Raytheon is a great company to work for. Dell, I worked there. Maybe I'll say a pretty good company to work for. <laughs> but, uh, but they're, they're good companies with a lot of benefits and good sized paychecks. But it's, it's bringing that focus down to get the business people in your community to give you the knowledge, skills, and abilities. Don't try to make them up on your own. Don't, don't try to use just national ones. And, and oh, go, by the way, we have the whole process for built business industry leadership <coughs> team the way to get the information and know you got it. So if you have been listening to me and kind of tuning me out for the last 18 years, uh, maybe you ought not to. Our, our current chair was one of, I heard one of the earliest graduates out of this program. Yep. Is, uh, and he said, I know what they're learning. I, I've seen their labs, I've seen their curriculum, I've helped change their curriculum. If I have a job opening for someone in network, why wouldn't I hire one of those people? That's what the build is going to do for you. You're going to have employers out there saying, we know what makes up that program. We're invested in it. We want to hire your students. So teaching them the right stuff and getting them a job, I think that's a pretty short list for what we should be trying to do. <clears throat> uh, I'll give first an example, then uh, to comment about the security part and the preparation of the students and the role of academia and industry. This example, this large health insurance company three years ago, when the company uh, compromised 80 million people records, the case was settled in court for 160 million. So my personal record for the insurance company that I had no choice in getting that insurance from my employer was two dollars, okay? So how much the big companies are willing to spend in training because the law, the legislation, does not enforce them to keep our privacy. Okay, that was three years ago, and my record cost $2. I don't know a university in the U.S. that does not teach a course in security, a certificate, I mean, a degree, etc. So, academia has been listening to industry for a long time, and you give the example of belts. Still, I don't see why industry are not cooperating that enough. How much is spent in training? Because the example of that big, large health company, health insurance company, shows they probably it's the money part. It just boils down to money. Industry expecting in, uh, academia to prepare that student is ready for the job. So jobs are listed with very high qualifications expected, no training whatsoever, just come and work from the first day. So it boils down to money, and the way really to enforce this, or to change this, is through a reasonable legislation that protects the privacy of the people. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just touch on that. I mean, uh, no, definitely, I mean, that's, that's a, uh, a big topic in the security world right now is you know balancing the risk and the costs and and it you know it's a business proposition you know it comes down to dollars ultimately and it comes down to the value to the business 
Um, so one of the, you know one of the things that we try to do um, as a, as a company is make security a, a business enabler and make it a way to help companies become more competitive and profitable actually and prevent them from having to pay out those fines and, and, and court settlements and things like that. So if we can position it in that way, you know, then it becomes something that's of value to the business and it's not just a cost and something that they just have to factor in, you know, that way. Uh, so a lot of what we're doing in terms of technologies and products is coming up with ways to, you know, make security to bake it into their development process, bake it into their application process at a very early stage and make it as automated as possible and then have tools you know on after that to monitor it and operate that uh, very easily um, you know and, and that's where the security jobs are going to come from is is in the development phase and what they call security operations and just having that a constant process in the application development process and just in the business process of the company and then in the monitoring part of it, just monitoring those events, monitoring all of those uh, different applications and tools that are out there and making sure that they're, they're running like they should. Um, and when we position it that way, you know, it, it becomes a, a competitive advantage for the company if they can, you know, operate that way. If, if I was a CIO, the last thing I want to do is go to business leaders and ask for a bucket of money for security. Hands down. Right. You don't go ask for a bucket of money for security. When you're going through your DevOps process, you integrate the security and the cost of security into that process. You hear, you hear the phrase now, I think it's a, what is it, a sec DevOps, which is a silly Dev name, Sec. by the way. Dev because security's always been part of DevOps. But you don't want to be asking for a bucket of money from a business person. It's hard to show that million dollars of advantage. It's like, well, it's cost avoidance. I don't want to have that breach. Well, we haven't had one in the last two years. Why do you think we're going to have one tomorrow? <laughs> it's your job to prevent that breach. I'm not giving you any money. So you build it in, you ask for money for the business solution that they want, not for the security that they don't care about. They only care about it after they've breached, not before. I get one more question and then I'm gonna open it to everybody else because we probably won't have enough time. But if you look at the title of what we were supposed to talk about today, this has all been building up to, what about your, your role in your own future career trajectory? Uh, we've been circling around cybersecurity, we've been circling around hybrid cloud. Uh, I know that this group has some definite opinions on what the students need to do in terms of controlling their own career trajectory, and I think it would be valuable for you to share with this group. So I'll, I'll kind of jump in, and, and this is a, a, you know, we have a, a formal mentorship program that, that we, we run at Dell, and, and most uh, corporations do at this point. Um, you know. It, I would give anybody, you know, the, the same advice, and, and, and hopefully this is something you guys can pass on to, to students as you engage with them. One, there is not enough focus on the uh, personal skills that are required to be effective and, and to find uh, prom yourself promoted regularly within the, the, the corporate world. Um, I would encourage whatever, like, I'm not a big self-help person, uh, but there are uh, really good books out there that address some of the things that, that we all do. Like I, I, you know, myself included, I would recommend two in particular. There's Emotional Intelligence 2.0 and Leadership and Self-Deception. Um, those are very good texts. They're not super, well, the second one is, is not dry at all. It's written more in narrative form. Um, and, and I would encourage students to read these things because there's a, uh, we all sometimes lack the perspective to take a step back and say, was that the right way to address that? Did I, did I do something that maybe could have been handled differently? If you're good at managing that, then that will help you manage your career. Second to that, I would say that everybody goes through a review period. When you sit down with a manager, they're asking of you or expressing to you what their expectations for you are. I would encourage them to ask their manager for something in return, not in a, a tit for tat, but in a, <laughs> hey, you're asking me to do this or you're saying that I have done these things that you asked me to do, here's what I'd like from you, right? I would like the opportunity to go to this training. I would like to, don't make it a, 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 a ultimatum, but you know, take those opportunities when you have dedicated time with your managers to express what your desires are 
so that they can facilitate your, your chosen track. Uh, the last thing that I would say is, as long as possible, avoid specialization. And, and be a generalist, learn the upstream, learn the downstream. Who do you work with? Who do you pair off to? If I do server administration, I, I am strongly linked to network and to shared storage to some degree in most cases. So if I don't understand their language, if I don't understand what they do, first of all, I lack empathy for when I ask them to do things that seem way out of control to them. Uh, second of all, we're, we're missing a common vocabulary that's required to, to fix complex problems, whether it be a new install or troubleshooting. So, you know, encourage them to stay generalized, to learn what their peers do in the other disciplines and to, to take on those disciplines as their own. Uh, and, and here's the, the reason I, I, I strongly caution against hyper-specialization, uh, exchange administrators. They're not there anymore, right? Microsoft spent a ton of money and earned a ton of money developing exchange administrators, certifying exchange administrators, and then they moved the, the home of exchange to Office 365 and actively subverted the people that paid them for a certification that provided value to their employer. And, and it wasn't done nefariously, it was the right business move, but you know, if you are so specialized and so comfortable that this is something that's going to be around forever, because I guarantee you five years ago, most people would have said there is no way my company is gonna put their email someplace <laughs> else. And now, you're viewed as a little bit crazy if you haven't made that transition. So, you know, that's, that's something that they, they need to understand and even if they do end up in that discipline, they need to actively seek and self-train as often as possible to the other di disciplines that are interrelated so that they're still relevant should that specialization all of a sudden disappear. Let me ask you if you will hang around for a few minutes because there are now lots of questions. Sure. And our time is up. Sorry, I lied to all of you because <laughs> we ran out of time. Uh, but I'd like to thank our panel for being here. Uh, we have certificates. Uh, how am I going to do this? <laughs> we got to have time for a couple of questions. Come yeah. On. Okay. Come on. <laughs> It's interesting to maybe hear your company's uh, technology plan for the next five or ten years because you talk about a lot of things as services. You're going to use Azure as a service. You're going to use AWS as a service. Well, like SMU created this program where they started talking about a data center degree because it's going to go somewhere. No matter how you use these services, still there's going to be an explosive use because of the internet and things and all that with data centers, storage all of that, so should we focus on those areas? And, and what you mentioned about the exchange server, you're exactly correct. What is that gonna mean in your company for the next 10 years if we're trained tra 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 a Java programmer and then that is now outsourced to some service and there's not that much need for Java programmers? Because we've tried to meet some of those needs, but as you just mentioned with the Microsoft stuff, there's not a big need for that anymore. Right. You know, he's a system admin and you know, he can, he can be an administrator where I had several administrators. So it would be really interesting to hear each one of your technology plans to kind of see where your companies are evolving, where we can kind of meet that need as well. So I'll, I'll start with the Dell perspective as, as best as I can. So Dell is a, a, a monster company that re is represented by several brands. And I'll, I'll throw a few of them out. VMware, Pivotal, RSA, SecureWorks, Circle Dell, which is really Dell Consumer, and then Dell EMC, which was the merger of Dell's uh, enterprise servers and Dell EMC's or EMC's, um, you know, historical storage and, and fiber channel business. Um, so there even is a little bit of infighting amongst those strategically aligned businesses that all fall under the Dell Technologies brand. Um, by and large, VMware's approach is. They want to be the quintessential cloud provider, right? So they want to enable. Um, I would say early on in the industry, as far as cloud came out, uh, we all took a defensive stance. Like, whoa, whoa, whoa you don't, that's, that's not secure. That's really not what it says it is, right? And we've all kind of like wisened up to that. And, and, and it's not necessarily a message I personally agreed to, but you, it was certainly 
you know, ran rampant within the within the our businesses. Um, from a hardware perspective, the investments are around making that hardware more flexible, more agile to meet the demands of workloads as they as they come out. Um, you know. It, Three years ago, nobody. The FPGA was the the private language of, of hardcore engineering, and now it's commonplace in the enterprise vernacular, right? So we're seeing FPGAs processing data, whereas before that was electrical engineering territory, right? <laughs> um, so you know we want to support fabrics and compute platforms from a Dell perspective that allow for those emergent use cases to be rapidly integrated and adopted. Um, and part of that is so we can compete with the public space on that, right? And, and it could, because Amazon can bring a whole ton of really, really smart guys to bear and they can make it as a service, but that as a service doesn't always necessarily meet the demands of the business. And so we're allowing the customer to build their custom tailored version of what that looks like. We're also allowing them to merge the experience of that on-prem and off-prem experience. Um, so it's you know, there's a, there's a lot happening hardware wise. There's quite a bit happening software wise. Everybody's looking to deliver to our customers force multipliers, things that allow the one individual to do the work of what ten individuals used to do. Um, and and you know the challenge of that is is doing that in a in a rapid fashion that's integrated but not so interlocked that we force our customers to make a choice of if you want this then you have to buy the Dell server with the VMware software with the this with this with this right so we want customers to have choice we just want to be the best choice from our perspective Does that kind of answer the question I, I wanted to add to that <clears throat> is uh, I'll, I'll get I'll try not to get on a soapbox over this but the World Economic Forum world group, they, they looked out at the future of jobs. And in 2030, 50% of the jobs that will exist do not exist today. That sounds like a long ways away. It's uh, 10 and a half years. It's not a long way away. Anybody graduating out of any of our schools, they're going to be in there probably in their 30s when that those 50% of jobs. Now the good news is, one of the ones not going away are IT jobs. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good news. The bad news is we can't predict what the specific skills, whether we'll need Java. We don't know whether we'll need Java. It could completely disappear and be outdated by a, a new language. <laughs> <laughs> but what we do know is that the skills around critical thinking and planning and communications and all the things that they need to be learning in our two-year degree program and that quest for knowledge, that's going to be what gets them to the next thing after Java or whatever else. So that's the real answer is what you're teaching has to center around the fact that we may not have Cisco voice over IP 10 years from now. There could be something new that comes out that completely gets rid of the Avias, the Cisco's, all those things. Routers could change unbelievably. Switches, they could all change to where we hardly recognize them anymore. It's just a hunk of iron tied to a bunch of software, which is occurring already. So I think that's the big thing is recognizing you're not trying to train a student to work out a piece of Cisco gear or a piece of Dell gear or EMC. You're trying to get them to have the wherewithal to be able to learn and have that hunger to go forward and continue to learn. That's how they avoid being the next uh, Microsoft Exchange administrator. Is, is anybody here familiar with the Gartner hype cycle? Has anybody seen this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I, I would encourage you guys to, to go find this document, read it, understand it. So when your students are like, I want to learn whatever, you're like, we're currently in the trough of disillusionment, <laughs> um, which is my favorite term ever. Yep. Um, so. Like, it, help them understand what's nascent, what's commonplace, use built for that. But Gardner is generally on target with that, that hype cycle and avoid the hype cycle for them, right? Put them on that, that top of the, that wave or more generally on the backside of that, which is where the entry level positions will exist. One last question and he promises that it will be short. Uh, cloud computing is the uh, future, as we all know. Um, Everyone keeps talking about cybersecurity, which is great, but who watches the watcher? <laughs> you got, you know, think about with cloud computing, everything is segregated, but it's virtual. So any company can run in, they can run massive amounts of illegal data, hit one button, delete it all, and there is no cyber 
crypto security anymore. It's gone. So who watches the watcher? The consumer does, I think. And that's where you get lawsuits, right? And so, yeah, I, I would say, you know, you can always advocate for regulation. You could ad advocate for, you know, some government organization or something like that. But I, I think really who watches the watcher is the consumer does. The marketplace does, right? And so um, they are the watchers. Right, and so sooner or later you're going to end up with something on Reddit or something on, on, on you know, some popular news program or something like that of some major issue, right? And then that's when you get the GDPR issues or whatever, wherever you are, you know. And so I think, I think really it's the consumer that watches the watcher. Yeah, and most, uh, I mean, organizations that I, that I work with, they're taking a multi-cloud approach. You know, and not putting all your eggs in one basket, right? Just, uh, you know, mo deal with multiple vendors and, you know, have, yeah, so it, it right. So, and this kind of speaks to your, your, your point earlier too. Fundamentally, corporations are not going to do any more than they're absolutely required to, right? And there's a few different levers that are used to put the pressure on those corporations. Brand image is one of them. Regulation is another one. Um, and then outright fines is the third, right? Like legal action. So, um, you know, more and more, they're becoming more sensitive to brand image impact, right? It's, it has a real value to them. They're starting to be able to calculate what that real value is. They can also calculate, there are formulas that exist of how, how at risk am I at as an organization? Am I a high value target? What is the target, that, what, what, what do we have that people would care about? So sound security practices, i.e. CISSP, designates that you need sound separation of duties, right? So the policy writers are not the policy enforcers. That is not absolutely true in most corporations, right? More often than not, security writes the policy and enforces it, and then also the loan auditor. But in the industries where it really matters, and, and more and more industries are starting to fall under this, there are external auditors, right? And, and part of that is they go through a pre-audit to know what the real audit is gonna look like, right? So they may use KPMG for their formal audit, and they'll use a different SI or a big partner for their pre-audit. So they kind of know what KPMG is gonna uncover and they can correct and then go through the formal process. So I have many customers who live in a perpetual state of audit and that, that continual iteration and review of what they're doing and how they're doing it is improving them. Um, but ultimately the, the three levers that exist, exist. And you know I think that the consumer is a fourth leather lever, but that also requires that consumers really uh, be punitive with these brands that are uh, a little bit haphazard with our data. We don't always get that choice. For instance, the insurance industry, right? So, you know, it, there, there's a, it, that is a huge conversation. Um, I think some, some areas are doing better. I think Europe did really good with GDPR, generally speaking, um, but ultimately, you know, if you don't fall under one of those three categories that you really care about, and it's not a top-line, executive-sponsored, monitored and controlled security practice, it's probably going to be underwhelming if you really get into the into the details of it. Okay, I think we're over, and we probably should quit. Let's thank our panel. everything I'm going to ask the panel to stand up and present the wonderful gift they just got. Yeah.